Shabbat Shalom. We are a nation of readers. We, as the Jewish people, love our books. But it's funny sometimes how much we love them, we may or may not always engage with them as deeply as we should. True, we have the weekly parasha, which hopefully you are keeping up with. After all, we've just begun. It's not too late and you could catch up easily. And that allows us to read through the first five books of the Tanakh each year in the cycle of the Torah reading. But there are other books to be read. Uh, the Talmud, you may famously know, has been divided into daily dapim, daily pages of study, which allow a person to complete the entire cycle of the Talmud in about seven and a half years. It takes a little longer than reading through the Torah, but it's, trust me, very much worth it. But if you want something perhaps a little bit more manageable, well, I mentioned last week that you might want to set your sights on reading the rest of the Tanakh, the Nach portion, Torah, Nevi'im Ketuvim, the last two sections, the prophets and the writings, in fact make the, the majority of what we call the Bible, the first five books being relatively small in comparison. And it just so happens there are many different schedules to read the rest of Tanakh to be able to complete it. And in fact, the most common lands us today on the fourth chapter of the book of Ezra. And just to show you that there's a lot that's worth reading, if you've never reached the end of the Bible to reach the, the book of Ezra, then you may not know this, there is a lot back there. So first of all, when did Ezra live? Is anybody here a history buff? Ah, so Ezra comes from that time period when many people stop reading. You see, we all know about the days of Moses, of course, right? The Torah, all of that, we reach the edge of the land of Israel, and then we go into Joshua, and most people are still okay there. And then there were some, like, um, judgy people, the Shoftim. And then we get the kings, and the kings are David and Solomon, and then... And then it gets a little blurry. But we do know that during that blurry period of all the string of kings, we get a bunch of prophets. And there's Isaiah, and there is Jeremiah, and Amos, and Hosea, and all those guys, and they're talking, and they're warning, and they're guiding... And then the Babylonians come along and boom, the destruction of the first temple. Ezra is after all of that, which is why he doesn't get as much attention. Ezra is there during the restoration, the rebuilding of the second temple. And Ezra in chapter four, well, he has a problem. You see, Cyrus, the king of the Persian Empire, who had allowed the Israelites to return and to rebuild the temple, well, Ezra has decided to actually take him up on the offer. And construction begins in Jerusalem. Finally, it will be rebuilt. But as the Israelites, the Jews, are coming together to rebuild, they are met with offers of assistance. You see, during our exile, when the Jews were taken out of the land of Israel and taken to Babylon, many other people were brought in. This was a common tactic in the ancient world. Indeed, it had been done in the northern area as well when the Assyrians had destroyed it. The idea being that if you are an emperor and you conquer a territory and you are worried about rebellion, you take the people from that land and you move them to some other lands where they have no connection. And then, in the new land, they'll be a little bit more placid. I mean, what are they going to be fighting for? Their own land? No, this land is just the place they're stuck. Well, people had been imported into the land of Israel, because obviously it's an empire. You don't want to leave the land fallow. You want it to be productive. So the people who had been brought in during the previous 70 or more years, if it was in the north, it was close to 200, those people walk up to Jerusalem and to Ezra and all the leaders of Israel and they say, oh, you're building a temple to Adonai, great. We'd like to join in because we worship Adonai too. And Ezra says to this incredibly generous and uh, amazing offer of assistance from the other people living in the land, no, no, you can't help. You can't help. Here we are just barely scraping by, just barely getting to rebuild the, the, the hope that of restoration just beginning to, to fan. 
And we have the other people of the land ready and willing to get on board with this amazing project. And he says no. Why would he say no? Who doesn't want help with trying to do something like this? Is it just chauvinism? Is he being prejudiced against them? No. You see, the people who were in the land, the people who had been imported into the land during our absence, they were not followers of Adonai in the sense that they were committed to the Torah, to the breach, to the covenant, and to the Jewish people. They were committed to Adonai because Adonai was the local big shot. This was the way of the ancient world. If you grew up in one town, and in that town they worship God number one, then you worship God number one. And if you move to a new city and that town worship God number two, then when you move to the new city, you worshiped God number two. Athens, you may know, was had Athena as their, their patron god, and so you worshiped Athena if you lived in Athens. If you moved to another town, you'd worship a different god. So the people who moved into the land of Israel, they worshiped Adonai because apparently this was his patch of dirt. And if it's his patch of dirt, then you want to get in good with the local god because that's going to make things right. And Ezra astutely recognized that this was not what it is to be a worshiper of Adonai. Adonai is not merely the local big boy that you want to uh, placate in order to get the proper benefits of membership in his club. Adonai is not merely isolated to a particular strip along the Eastern Mediterranean. God is the God of the entire world, and God is a God of justice, and God is a God of peace. God is not a God of a zip code. And for these people to think that they would like to participate, they were not merely saying that they want to help build. They were saying, we own and have the same claim and the same understanding and thus the same relationship with this God as you Jews do. And if we lived in Athens, we'd want to build the Acropolis. And if we lived in Baghdad, we want to build whatever they're building there. Because that's what it means. And Ezra says, no, you don't understand. Your commitment is not to God. Your commitment is merely to the local manifestation of power. And that is not what should be the foundation of this temple. I do know he was right. Because as soon as he said no thank you to their help, what did they do? They ran off and complained to the Persian Empire that the Jews were being terrible and they were going to rebel and that you shouldn't allow them to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. And they began to attack and dissuade and, and, and disparage and terrify the Jews that were trying to rebuild. They had no interest in there being a temple to Adonai if they couldn't own a piece of it. Ezra saw that their offer was not a true offer of joining the Jewish people. It was not an offer of becoming part of the breach of the covenant. It was not an offer of coming beneath the wings of the Shekhinah of God's presence. It was just an offer of participating in the local power politics. And Ezra was not willing to sell the temple down for that kind of price. It meant that the temple took longer to get built. It meant that there were more delays and more petitions and more government issues that had to be resolved. But it meant that when the temple was built, it stood on a stronger foundation. It may not have been as fabulous as the first temple. It may not have been as fabulous as it could have been had we let any and all throw in their pitch, their bricks, their contribution, without any question of whether they were actually committed to what was going on. But the temple that emerged was stronger. It lasted longer, and it stood for what it should. It stood for a God that was a God for everyone, not only of that strip of land, not only of that small location in the Mediterranean in the world, but a God that truly reached out, asking the people simply come together, not in pursuit of power, not in pursuit of glory, not in pursuit of prestige, but in pursuit of justice, in pursuit of righteousness. For some, that's a bit too high of a price. For us, it worked. 
and the fact that we were willing to remain loyal to that God even when we were driven from that second temple and we didn't adopt the practices and adopt the religions of the other countries to which we were scattered shows that we made the right choice for we have endured, we have persisted, and we have thrived. Shabbat Shalom.